2016 marked a particularly sad year because cancer for the first time became the leading cause of death in 11 European countries and the others are soon gonna follow that trend. Despite the fact that we have actually spent humongous amounts of money since 1971, Nixon declared the war on cancer, we actually have not managed to dramatically reduce the death rate of this devastating disease. This sounds all very frustrating, but the past years, we've really witnessed a couple of fundamental changes, how we can approach this problem. And Nana and I have thought about what would be, if we bring this down to like just three bullet points, what are these changes? We came up with three true revolutions in cancer. One is the ability to look at cancer genomes completely, thanks to deep sequencing, so we can actually study the enemy in the greatest detail possible. The second and equally important revolution is the advent of genetic approaches, which allow us to study cancer cells mechanistically uh, in whole new ways. And the third comes actually from clinical breakthrough successes in the use of an entirely different treatment concept. And this is the modulation of the immune system to treat cancer. And this is really a paradigm shift for uh, the way we approach uh, cancer in the clinic and has added uh, a new arsenal of possible therapies. So I want to give you uh, some snapshots on all these revolutions, what, what excites us about it and where we're standing with those. Since about 10 years ago, uh, deep sequencing emerged as a really high throughput technique. The sequencing of genomes has become extremely cheap. And we've used this massively in cancer. We've now sequenced over a million genomes from different cancer patients, in many cases, the entire genome. And if you look at these genome sequences, we see a very shocking picture. They're filled with mutations. In those one million patients, we see over five million individual different mutations. And they occur at different frequencies. Some cancers have about 100 mutations, but some cancers like melanoma and lung cancer have up to 30,000 mutations acquired. Not all of these mutations drive this disease, but from looking at the frequency of these mutations and knowing about their function from research, we actually can identify so-called cancer driver genes, which we believe are causally involved in promoting cancer. And this number is steadily rising, but currently we estimate this number somewhere slightly below 600 genes that are actually causally involved. These don't occur in patterns one gene per patient, but they actually occur in very complex patterns per patient, somewhere between five and over 30 mutations for an individual patient. So from patient to patient, this disease is very heterogeneous. But even more problematic is the fact that actually even within patients, this disease is heterogeneous because Cancer evolves as an evolutionary process where one mutation after the other is acquired. So the end product we're facing in the clinic is a mix of cells, each harboring different types of mutations, which makes it very hard to find the ones that we can tackle with therapy. Among these so-called cancer driver mutations, only very few are actually directly druggable. These are called oncogenes, and some of these oncogenes we can target with so-called targeted therapies. The vast majority of mutations are loss of function mutations. They cause loss of a gene and loss of the protein. And we cannot build drugs to bring that back. However, these few therapeutic options we have in targeting active oncogenes have led to some really major clinical successes. The first one, this all started, and this is still a story which inspires us in our research, is a relatively rare form of leukemia, chronic myeloid leukemia, which is a little bit special because it's driven by only one major oncogene, is this so-called bcr able fusion protein. An inhibitor against the enzymatic function of this protein has actually turned this previously incurable disease into an almost completely manageable condition. And we have now patients living over 15 years with this previously deadly cancer. Other kinases and similar oncogenes have been targeted. For instance, the BRAF 
uh, mutations, which is much more common than BCR able, occurs in different cancers. For instance, in malignant melanoma, where this mutation is particularly common. As you may know, melanoma is regarded as one of the most aggressive cancers. And here we see a patient who is actually a very advanced disease with already metastatic lesions in the skin. If we apply this inhibitor of this one oncogenes of the many mutations these cancers carry, we see that this disease can completely regress back into a condition that looks basically normal. However, it only takes a few weeks for this patient to relapse with, again, a metastatic disease in the skin, which is often even more aggressive than the original tumor. So while there are clear success stories of these targeted therapies, they really remain only available for a limited number of patients because only few mutations are actually approachable with these agents. In addition, both the heterogeneity of tumors and evolutionary processes in cancer can cause resistance to these agents. So clearly we need more targets to tackle this problem, and those can be identified by actually functionally understanding these driver mutations. And regardless of whether these driver mutations are actually activating a gene function or a gene is even lost, we know that mutations in cancer functionally converge to actually deregulate again and again the same cellular processes. And these fundamental changes of a cell are associated with additional vulnerabilities of a cancer cell where we can name genes that are more required in a cancer cell than a normal cell. And these are called cancer dependencies. And over the past years, we have identified more and more of these dependencies that are equally promising for the development of clinical therapies. Now, the problem we have with these dependencies is that we cannot identify them by looking at cancer genomes or studying deregulated processes in cancer, we actually have to identify them through trial and error. And I'll tell you today that this is not so trial and error anymore. Once we have identified them, there comes a second challenge. We typically don't understand why a cell is dependent, more dependent on that gene than another cell, which poses a huge challenge for developing clinical biomarkers to guide these therapies and basically match a certain therapeutic with a patient population that will respond to this therapy. We have no clue about resistance mechanisms either. And in many cases, these are quite fundamental regulators in the cell. So we have to be concerned about whether it's even safe to inhibit these genes. So these are many questions. And for answering these questions, a second revolution is actually providing a fundamental uh, change to our research. And these are um, new genetic, functional genetic tools. And to give you a little snapshot on how these tools work, I have to take you back to your biology lesson, where you hopefully remember that our genome uh, is encoded in DNA, but in a cell only few genes are read from that genome and via a molecule called RNA turned into a protein. And we can interfere with this process now with various techniques. One, now already one of the oldest, is RNA interference which basically blocks this process of translating a gene into a protein. And in result, we actually see a suppression of that protein. And we like this fact because this closely mimics the inhibition by a drug. A second true revolution in research is the invention of CRISPR-Cas9, which actually started in one research line here at the Vienna Biocenter. CRISPR-Cas9 can be used to introduce a very specific mutation in the genome at a site I want to mutate. And beyond other applications of this magic tool, what we can just do is we can delete a gene completely and thereby cause a complete loss of a protein. And again, then study its function. A very neat feature uh, of both of these tools is that they're based on so-called small RNAs, which we use to guide these machineries to a certain gene of interest. And we can deliver these small RNA molecules, not only in a way where we take one at a time, suppress one gene and study whether it affects the cancer cell, but we can do this in a pooled way where we test many genes at a time. The way we do this is we deliver these small RNAs into cells in a way 
that every cell will take only one of them. So in each cell, a different gene will be suppressed or deleted. And now if you want to know which genes are required for the survival of a cell, we only have to follow these cells over time because small RNAs which kill their cells will disappear from this population and we can see this in deep sequencing. So these are so-called dropout screens. And this technology started to work more and more robustly about uh, seven years ago and in the first successful screen we have identified uh, a new drug target in leukemia called BRD4. BRD4 is a very basic protein involved in gene regulation. But if we suppress it using RNAi in leukemia cells, these cells start to differentiate. This is a very intended response in leukemia um, because they stop dividing. And if we mark these leukemia cells and inject them into mice and follow them using an imaging marker, we can see that the suppression of BRD4 in these four mice over here leads to a marked reduction in disease progression compared to cells that have normal BRD4. So at the time we were very lucky because a small molecule inhibitor of this protein was just identified so we could directly test whether this genetic effect translates into a drug and indeed it does uh, if we inhibit BRD4 now using a small molecule inhibitor we see the same effect on cell differentiation and the same effect on disease progression in mice. So this has sparked a lot of excitement about BRD4 as a drug target in cancer and meanwhile several very potent BRD4 inhibitors have been developed, one actually across town from our partners and collaborators at Beringer Ingelheim. And these molecules have meanwhile entered clinical trials. The screening approach has dramatically changed over the past five years, particularly due to CRISPR, which allows us to systematically basically look at the entire genome and ask the question, which of the 20,000 genes is required for survival of a particular cell? And we end up with maps where we picture this required for survival or not in a color code. Here we look at about 20,000 genes. This is just a few of them, but the list would expand to 20,000. And here we have an increasing number of cell lines where we have this information available. Approximately 500 are in the public domain. So now if you look at these profiles, which we're actually doing every day now, because they are one of the most inspiring data sets in our research, you see, we can call very easily genes that are broadly required for cancer cell survival. But what's much more fascinating, of course, is this very focal effect of just two genes being required in only two of many, many cell lines tested. If you look at what these genes are and what these cell lines are, we actually find this BCR-able fusion protein I told you earlier about very specifically required. And indeed, these are the two CML cell lines in this panel harboring this mutation. So if we wouldn't have discovered BCR-able by now, we would have seen it now. Some of these dependencies we can actually link to uh, certain mutations. But actually most of the dependencies we see, we cannot understand at all. We have no clue why a certain cell depends on that gene now and why a certain cell doesn't. But another experiment we can actually do is to ask very specifically whether a defined mutation in cancer leads to a certain vulnerability because this is what we hypothesize for at least some of these mutations. So as I told you, uh, most mutations in cancer are actually loss of function mutations, meaning the gene is deleted and the protein is lost. But there are already some examples telling us that losing a given gene can make cells dependent on another gene. Often these genes have similar functions and a normal cell can afford losing one of them, but losing both of them will kill it. And this concept is called synthetic lethality. And this is one concept which we hope we can exploit for cancer therapy, because after all, there's many genes lost in a cancer cell. So to do this experiment, we can repeat the screens I told you before, but now not do it in many cell lines, but just do it in two cell lines. One that doesn't have a certain mutation, and the other one that does it, and that is the only thing that is different between these two cell types. And now we ask at the end of the screen, is there a single gene that is required 
in the cell which has the mutation and not required in the normal cell. And the first molecule we decided uh, to take on this approach is a molecule that has been studied for many decades actually at the IMP and many of the uh, fundamental knowledge about this molecule uh, derives from research at the IMP and this is the cohesin ring which is a very beautiful ring that entraps two chromatids during cell division. So these are the chromosomes and around those spans the cohesin ring. To the researchers who've worked for many decades on cohesin, but also to the cancer research, the biggest surprise was that cancers actually very frequently carry mutations in components of this ring, which is not really clear why that is, but it's a very frequent phenomenon. About 7.5% of all human cancers have mutations in the ring or its regulators. And the most important mutation among them are mutations in one of these molecules, and that is called STEC2. So this is the first one we studied, and to study this we uh, introduced the STEC2 mutation in the cell line and asked, like, after introducing the STEC2 mutation, will there be additional genes required? And now it's going to be the most complex figure of my talk, but this has also been one of the most exciting figures in our lab, so I wanted to share this with you. So each dot in this figure represents one gene, so we have about 20,000 dots here. On this axis you see whether the gene is required in these STEC2 null cells, and these uh, axis depicts whether the gene is required in cells which have normal STEC2. So the more you're on the left here and the more you're down here, the more you are an essential gene. So what you can already see is most genes that are required for survival of one cell are also required for survival of the other cell. And actually, this is true for almost all genes. And we have to look very carefully at this data to not miss something very important. And this is one gene which behaves differently. It's completely neutral in normal cells. But if you take away STEC2, this gene becomes truly essential. It behaves just like an essential gene. And that gene is called, intriguingly, STEC1. And thanks to many years of basic research at the IMP and a recent collaboration between different groups at Beringer Ingelheim, at the IMP, and various other collaborators, we actually understand how this works. So normal cells actually harbor two types of these rings. One at the ends of the chromosome is held together by STAG1, and towards the middle of the chromosome is actually more dominated by rings that contain STAG2. And there's only rings with STAG1 or STAG2, there's never rings which have both of these molecules. Now in normal cells, if we take away STAG1, the two chromatids are still held together by STAG2 in the middle. Maybe they suffer a little bit, but they're not falling apart. But in cancer cells where we have lost STAG2, the prediction would be that chromatids are only held together by STAG1, and this is exactly what we see. If we inhibit STAG1 in cancer cells, the chromosomes fall apart, which is actually not compatible with cell survival. And once the cells try to enter the next cell division, they will die. So this is just one example of many new therapeutic concepts that are currently being discovered through the use of these new functional genetic tools. But once we have discovered these very basic genetic interactions, there's many questions remaining until we can turn this into a therapy. Is it efficient and how safe is it to inhibit a gene in a real human being? What are mechanisms predicting the response to this inhibition? What are biomarkers to select patients? And what are resistant mechanisms to these agents? And here again, functional genetic tools help us to answer these questions before we actually embark on the long and expensive process of drug development. But everything I told you so far happened in a cell culture dish. And this is quite ignorant because we know that cancer cells in a cell culture dish behave very differently from cancers in a human patient. And about some of these challenges and about some of the opportunities in studying cancer in a real organism, uh, Anna will tell you about in the second half of the talk. So as Hannes already alluded to, 
uh, we don't want to eradicate tumors in a cell culture dish, but we are actually treating metastatic patients. And there's a couple of features that are very, very different in a patient than in a cell culture dish, and they have very big implications in drug discovery and validation. And these features cannot be modeled in a dish, and this is why we need appropriate um, disease models. One of these features is that these tumors display a tremendous amount of heterogeneity. And this goes even so far that if a tumor is predicted to be sensitive to a targeted therapy, for example, by the presence of a BRAF mutation, there can be additional alterations that lead to some of those clones being less sensitive and some of these clones even already being resistant to this kind of targeted therapy before the patient is being treated. But what makes this even more complicated is an additional layer of complexity which is that these cancer cell clones, they are just not living next to each other, but in fact, they communicate with each other all the time. And they do this either directly via cell contact or via a vast array of secreted factors that are constantly emitted from the cancer cells. And this plays a very important role in processes like metastasis uh, or cancer progression, but also a very important role in uh, the response of the cancer cell clones to targeted therapy. And this is something that I studied previously uh, during my postdoctoral work at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And what we found is that when we treat these heterogeneous tumors with a mutation-specific targeted therapy, that targeted therapy-sensitive clones, they indeed start to suffer. But they don't go down without a fight. They start to emit what we call a therapy-induced secretome. And this therapy-induced secretome is extremely rich in survival signals. And what happens is that these signal to the sensitive clones and help them to increase them, their survival. And they also now signal to the therapy-resistant clones that are present already before the start of therapy or are evolving during this uh, pressure uh, that the targeted therapy is putting on this tumor and stimulates their outgrowth and metastasis. And ultimately, the combination of these things with a number of other features leads to the failure of this targeted therapy in these patients, similar to what we've seen before in this impressive picture of the melanoma patient that initially responded so well, but then ultimately relapsed. But the cancer cells, they just not communicate only with each other. They also have a direct interaction with the tissues in which they reside in. And as you probably know, 90% of cancer-related deaths are not due to the primary tumor, but it's because the cancer cells have metastasized to different organs. And as you can imagine, these tissues are entirely different from each other, and the cancer cells need a completely different set of qualities to colonize these different organs. And this is also something that we studied in animal models, where we used the mouse really as a cell sorter. So what we can do is we can take a heterogeneous tumor cell population that is also labeled with a GFP and luciferase marker so that we can track the tumor cells in the mouse. And we inject this in the left ventricle of the heart so that the tumor cells get into the circulation of this mouse. And uh, the tumor cells can then colonize the different organs. And we can then harvest those organs, re-isolate those cells, put them in culture. And they look the same, but we know already that the transcriptional programs are no different because they have now been selected for their ability to grow in those organs. But what is really fascinating is that when we re-inject those tumor cells now in mice, they remember where they came from and they go straight either to the brain, to the lung, or the bone, showing that there is a really intricate uh, connection between the cancer cells and the tissue, and that the cancer cells can actually remember this. Moreover, when tumor cells arrive in a new tissue, they also are in need of nutrition and oxygen, and they establish their own blood supply. As you can see here, it's very organized in a normal tissue and very aberrant in a tumor. This has huge implications on the delivery of drugs, and it is a drug target itself. And then finally, there's a very important interaction of the tumor with the immune microenvironment. 
These are a multitude of cells, some of which are even recruited by the tumor because they aid the tumor proliferation and metastasis, but other cells that are excluded from the tumor to protect the tumor cells. And this is all driven by secreted signals from the tumor itself. And this has established a new field of immuno-oncology, which led to a paradigm shift on how we treat cancer by understanding these signals. Our immune system is able to distinguish self from non-self. And while this is very easy for bacteria or viruses, it's a little bit more complicated for tumors because it arises from within us. But here, the vast number of mutations that are found in tumors are now used to make the tumor recognizable to the immune system. Moreover, the immune system is adaptable which is important for bacteria, viruses, but also very important for cancer, which quickly evolves. And finally, immunological memory. We all know from vaccinations that we are protected long term uh, from infections, and this also plays an important role in cancer. This is a key concept that was already recognized by Paul Ehrlich in the 19th century, and he proposed the concept of immune surveillance, namely that the immune system is very important for eradicating malignant cells in our body. And once we understand the immune system, that we could also use it to fight cancer. Around the same time in New York, there was a young surgeon William Coley, who was very frustrated with the fact that the patients he operated on still died of their metastatic cancer. But there was also uh, case reports that he was quite fascinated about, which were that patients that had uh, suffered from infections also appeared to have a spontaneous tumor regressions of their tumors. So he decided to utilize this and injected bacteria toxins uh, into patients with tumors, and the first patient already had a spectacular response. Within days, the tumor was gone. However, this was, uh, after all, uh, still a bit of an exception. The vast majority of patients responded only very late. For example, this patient after 63 injections or never. And so because it was not predictable which patient was going to respond and which one was not, the therapy was soon forgotten in favor of uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapeutic approaches. But basic research has given us over the past decades unique insights into the interaction of T cells and tumor cells. T cells can recognize tumor cells via new antigens that are presented on their surface they get activated and then kill the cancer cell. However, there are also fail-safe mechanisms in place that protect our body from autoimmunity. And these are hijacked by the cancer cells to block the T cell response. The investigation of these mechanisms have now resulted to a completely new type of therapy that blocks these type of interaction and reactivates T cells that lead to the killing of the cancer cell. These immunotherapies have really led to remarkable responses. As you can see here, a melanoma patient with a metastasis in the lung that was completely eradicated after treatment with immunotherapy. But what is so special about this is that these are not isolated cases anymore. A large fraction of patients respond and their responses are durable. So following the treatment successes of immunotherapies with melanoma, immunotherapies have now been extended to a variety of common cancer types like lung cancer that are associated with a large number of mutations or specific types of colorectal cancer or cancer types that are associated with viruses and are thus visible to the immune system. However, there are many challenges that are remaining. About half of these patients do not respond to immunotherapies. And moreover, there is a very large fraction of cancers that do not respond to immunotherapies at all. And this is why the field is in search for new mediators that could enhance the immune response. And they are looking here at additional targets in the immune cells, as well as tumor-specific targets for example, oncogenic pathways that would instruct the tumor immune microenvironment via secreted molecules, as I told you before. 
To summarize these advancements, we can here look at Kaplan-Meier plots, where here on the y-axis we see the percent survival of patients and on the x-axis the time. And we can clearly see that targeted therapy has shifted this curve. However, there is a lack of durable responses that we have with targeted therapies. This is something that we observe with immunotherapy, where there is a fraction of patients that have these long-term responses. But what is very clearly the goal is to shift this survival curve even further, and this is something we can do with combination therapies. The sheer number of combinations that are possible represent a major challenge for academia, the pharmaceutical industry, and the clinic. But now we have a toolbox consisting of functional genetic tools as well as disease-relevant models that allow us now to identify the most promising targets and evaluate the most promising combinations for drug development. Thank you. Thank you.